You're listening to an Airwave Media Podcast. I feel like who Art Ed? Try to spice it. Who Art is? Mr. Wood, Art Ed, me. <laughs> yeah. Either way, it, it's ambiguous. It works on so many levels. I know. That's off to a great start. Welcome to Who Arted, where we explore visual arts and an audio medium. I'm your host, Kyle Wood, and joining me once again, I have Kelly Henriksen, our teacher at Park Junior High. Thanks for joining me. Thank you for having me. Oh, I I am really happy that you were able to come on. And once again, you're sharing an artist that, you know, you have a little bit of a connection to. I guess I have a little bit of a connection to as well. Ivan Albright, honestly, is one of those artists that I loved and then forgot about. And then every time I see it, it's like, yep, that's that's what I loved, you know? Yeah. I, I wonder if that's what my experience was, too, if I forgot about him. I always... Sometimes they'd move his work not in the same space and they'd move it. And then I'd always be looking for it. And sometimes it wasn't there. I think that happens sometimes. Yeah, I think I think that happens quite a bit where you see stuff in a certain gallery for, for a while. And then, you know, curators got to move stuff around just to keep it fresh. Because right. I think it's studies show like you become almost blind to stuff that you see in the same spot all the time. And so it's a good idea to rearrange the pictures on your walls to keep enjoying it and rediscovering those pieces. But yeah, sometimes you forget about those things when, when you don't see them in your normal route through the museum. Um, But I guess we should really start at the beginning with Ivan Albright. He was born February 20th, uh, 1897 in Harvey, Illinois. He actually came from an artistic family. Um, His family had German roots and back in Germany, the family name was Albrecht. And his grandfather was a renowned gunsmith. Now, while I am not particularly fond of guns or weapons or violence in general, um, you know, That is an art form. I mean, people are working in metals and for some people, those are beautiful sculpted objects. And, um, Ivan Albright's grandfather was great at that, at that craft. And then Ivan's father was an impressionist painter. We got to remember this is the late 19th century. So that was really, that was the avant-garde at that time was impressionism in the late 19th century, getting into the 20th century. So Ivan's parents settled in Harvey, not too long after the town was founded. I guess I settled is probably the wrong term. They happened to be in Harvey because from what I understand, they moved around quite a bit in the early years of Ivan's life, but... Harvey was just founded in 1891 and Ivan and his twin brother, Malvin, which Malvin, I was not even aware that was a name, but they were born in 1897, just like six years after the town had been founded. I imagine Harvey was probably a pretty nice town at that time because it was like it was meant to be a sort of planned community, I think modeled after like the Pullman company town. And it was meant to be like, you know, just this nice place, uh, I think big on the temperance movement and everything like that. Um, But I imagine it had that like new town smell and everything was still fresh and clean. I don't even know if I've been like in Harvey to know, like if there was like a little like main town, like, you know, some downtown say have like, did they have a main town? I don't know. I should have researched that a little bit better. Yeah. Harvey. I mean, it's sort of South side, you know, um, like I, I, to me, Harvey runs in with like blue Island and all of those other like smaller oh, yeah. pockets and villages and stuff like that. Harvey's sort of South side, but he was, he was, Born there, like I said, just a few years after it was established. And I just, I imagine it fresh and new and clean and exciting. But like I said, they moved around a little bit in his early years. And then speaking of nice places to be, they ended up a little bit north. He ended up in New Trier High School. And then he went to Northwestern for a little while. He, I guess, failed out of Northwestern. Which I didn't know that. I didn't. I didn't, I didn't, I don't think I knew he went there and I don't think I knew he failed out. Yeah. Cause I always associate him with like, um, the art Institute and everything like that. But yeah, he, he 
went to Northwestern. In 1916, he went to U of I in Urbana. He was considering like architecture or chemical engineering, which to me feels like pretty broad differences. And I, I, like, I don't know that I'm going to go into engineering if I failed out of a school. Correct. It's, it's, <laughs> yeah, a, it's a pretty no. tough field. Right. But, yeah. um, you know, I guess I, I got to appreciate the confidence. He obviously ended up in the arts. He grew up, like I said, in an artistic family. And his father was not just a painter. Like, he he used Ivan and Malvin as models for his paintings, which I think is just so sweet to think of. Like he was a model for his father's paintings. He's, he's watching his father and then he's like meeting all these impressionists and realist painters in sort of the family circle of friends and acquaintances. And then he goes into that family business. There's, there's kind of like a just quaint, wholesome story there, which I find ironic given how Ivan Albright has this um, reputation as being so macabre. Yeah. So he ended up like submitting some work for the, uh, an exhibition at, at the Art Institute of Chicago in 1918. It was accepted because, of course, his work was pretty good. And not long after that first showing, he and his brother go into the Army, the medical corps, during World, World War One. And being in the medical corps during World War One, I, I have to imagine, was just... A life-altering event. I mean, as I as I alluded to earlier, Ivan Albright is associated with the macabre. He's sort of seen as really brilliant at showing just the frailty of the human body. And I have to think a lot of that has to do with his experience in World War One. Because yeah. not only to be in war, but to be in the medical corps at that time. Like you're seeing some stuff. Yeah. I mean, and I think that's where he started having those portraits that became the decaying or how it looked like decaying, even if it wasn't. Yeah. I mean, that's where I, I, I agree. This had to change him to paint maybe in a different way. Yeah. And I think part of it is probably because when you think about world war one, that was also at a time when, you know, machine guns and just the, the weapons of war took this huge advance forward. It feels weird to say even forward when we talk about how people became so much better and more efficient at killing each other and hurting each other. But it was, it was a nasty battle um, that took its toll on a lot of people. And he was observing all of this happening in the medical context And while he was there, I guess he filled like eight sketchbooks with medical drawings of surgeries and wounds and other things that he observed. And so then after that, he comes back and he briefly worked in like advertising. I feel like that is the early 20th century training ground for artists, you know, like you, you weren't quite ready for prime time. So, you know, in the gallery world, but you can do some stuff for advertisements. Yeah. Then he went to SAIC. So, um, my old alma mater, gotta love it. SAIC school of the art Institute of Chicago, clearly the best art school in the world. Um, (laughs) I mean, if it produced someone as, as adequate as me, it had to be great. But, Ivan studied painting and Malvin studied sculptures. He continued his training at the National Academy of Design. And while he was there, he studied under Charles Webster Hawthorne, which, you know, Charles Webster Hawthorne, not like a household name today. I don't know if you're familiar with his work. No. He, he was a portrait artist, reasonably successful. He, he taught quite a bit as well. And one of his other students, aside from Ivan Albright, was Norman Rockwell. And again, I love that idea that Ivan Albright and Norman Rockwell learned from the same dude. Yeah, that's incredible. I, I was kind of shocked when I learned that information because I was like, wow, I had no idea where they're... I'm, 
tra- their mutual training came from or where that was from. It was really neat to to read about that. Yeah, and I mean, it, on some level, it, I mean, it kind of makes sense because when you think about it, both of them were very skilled draftsmen, very, very good at portraiture and capturing the human form. They just had a very different outlook on it. Um, as we've already alluded to, Albright was doing stuff that was very much focused on the frailty and decay and, and it's much darker. Whereas Norman Rockwell was doing stuff that was idyllic. I mean, it was just thematically the opposite end of the spectrum. Yeah. I wonder if they both got their like every day, because some of Ivan's portraits are still everyday scenes, even though the people are decaying. So maybe they have that same, idea of here's my everyday scene I don't know there's something about his work and then not to go back to world war one have you ever seen any of these sketchbooks or sketches because I feel like I I I wonder where they're at or if the art institute owns owns those and they're you know maybe they're just not put on display because I've never seen those I would love to see maybe some of those sketches just to see what he was like. And I would like to see that watercolor from 1918 as well. So I think it probably is in the art Institute's collection somewhere. Cause you know, they have a ton of stuff beyond what we see oh, yeah. out on display. And one of the things that I think was brilliant about Albright was he knew to like make inroads with the, the museums and everything like yeah. that. And it was, it was kind of this mutual aid, if you will, because yeah. he, he actually didn't need the money. Um, his father, I think was supporting him and everything like that. Yeah. Um, having come into his career in the mid to late 1920s, you know, that was like the stock market crash, the great depression. Right. And, Ivan Albright said it didn't really matter to him and his career when the economy tanked because even in the best economic circumstances, nobody was buying his work anyways. (laughs) (laughs) But, but, you know, like a lot of other artists, he kind of came from a family of means that could support him. And so he, he was doing all right. I mean, he did other things like worked with the WPA, still got some money that way, but he had the, the freedom to donate a lot of his stuff to the museum. And that helps build up the museum's collection in the early 20th century and all of that. So then they start presenting him as a nice prominent artist and look at the great stuff we've got from none other than Ivan Albright. And he was always willing to like make swaps with galleries and, and museums, like give them a newer, better painting and a more significant yeah. work to put into their collection. So the art Institute of Chicago has a ton of his stuff. Now, as far as the specifics of the medical drawings and stuff like that, I could not tell you with certainty if that's in their collection. I have seen, I've seen pictures of that stuff, but I've seen like digital stuff. I haven't seen that firsthand or if I have, I've forgotten it. Yeah. I just wonder where that, that might be. I mean, or maybe he gave it to a different gallery or something at earth in somebody else's private collection. It's possible. Um, I just remember as a kid going to the art institute and seeing his work and it was so much different than everyone else's. So it stood out. And I, I wonder how many, even young kids have seen his work and thought, wow, this is really the details and how incredible it is. It'd yeah. be interesting to see that change, like the watercolor from 1918. And then, you know, some of his other work that is part of that collection that is already out. It'd just be cool to see. Yeah. That first watercolor, I believe was a lot happier a lot brighter um but or those early days like he wasn't as strong of a draftsman and if i recall correctly like the sketches were were good i mean better than what i produce but he wasn't at the level of like fine craftsmanship that he was in the pieces that we know him for today I'll put pictures on the website of a couple of his pieces because you can find some stuff that's a little bit earlier. And I I would put a lot of it as 
those early works were kind of just landscapes and showing that impressionistic influence. Yeah. And, and, you know, I'll put one or two of his medical stuff as well, but where he really came into his own was when he was doing these portraits later on. And for, for this one, I wanted to focus on the, the picture of Dorian Gray because I absolutely love that piece. Um, I I was just blown away. I think the first time that I saw it, it, it's at the Art Institute of Chicago, which is our local hometown museum. And I remember growing up, going to the museum from time to time. And this is one of those pieces that I remember looking at, and it was just a revelation. Like, I can't believe somebody painted this. I know the details are just fantastic. They're absolutely incredible. Yeah. So I've been, I've been bullying the conversation a bit. I want to let you go first. Oh, what, no. what do you think about this one? What, what's jumping out at you? Well, what I didn't realize um, until probably the late nineties that he was commissioned for this piece. And I didn't know that, you know, when seeing it often, and I told you about how, um, I created brochures. I worked in the basement of the Art Institute um, in graphic design, and I created brochures for a show that they were doing. And I, I didn't know a lot about it, these pieces until then, but I always loved them. And in fact, I had forgotten his name from time to time because you'd visit the museum and then the stuff, they must, you know, move things around or, you know, maybe they were, you know, restoring some things and it wasn't there. But um, so I'd forget his name and I'm really bad at names. So that's where this would come into play. <laughs> I can't imagine what that would feel like. I'd be like, I love all these details. These are my favorites. I remember like being like eight, being on a field trip from school and saying that these are my favorites. And my grandmother was like, why would you love these? Because no one else paints this way, these magical <laughs> details and reflections and highlights and shadows. And um, they just have this eerie feel, but you just love them. I don't, I don't know. So for me, I, this, these are my absolute favorite pieces, the, the decaying food pieces that I can't find the pictures to. I, at some point I had a book, but a lot of my books, you know, you give them to somebody or let them borrow and you don't always get them back. So I don't, I don't know where my Ivan Albright book went, but um, it, the work is just incredible. And I personally don't know how to use the color red when painting. I'm more of a cool color. And the amount of red that he uses and the way like it's perfectly, you know, added in it's, and with blues, it's incredible. I don't know. So for me, it's just the details are, I, I can't, you can't stop looking at it. And this piece in particular, um, for years, I didn't know what this was about. And like then learning it's about this, this film and um, it's a portrait of Dorian Gray. And you're just like, wow, this is so eerie. There's so much more to this than I ever knew. But I'm just fascinated by every little texture and detail created. And I always want to look at new things. When you see it hanging in the Art Institute of Chicago, I want to look at new things. Like what's something that I missed last time? Because you always find something new in it or a little detail that you didn't see before in his work. That's just incredible. Yeah. And I guess the Cliff's Notes version of the picture of Dorian Gray, for those who are unfamiliar, uh, this is a story written by Oscar Wilde. Oscar Wilde wrote this story about Dorian Gray was this character who was incredibly handsome, but kind of a jerk. And Dorian Gray had sort of a Faustian bargain or a, a deal with the devil that basically he would retain his good looks and all of that physical appeal. But the portrait of him that was up in his attic would rot and show the ugliness of his character. And so, um, I always remember that because I was not always the nicest person. And I remember, <laughs> as Wait, a teen, <laughs> I remember that because as a teenager, um, <laughs> somebody turned to me after I, I made a, an awful joke and he just goes, somewhere there is a picture of you rotting in an attic That's or something terrible. like that. <laughs> and I was just like, oh, you think I'm handsome. Um, <laughs> so... <laughs> It was one of the nicest things anyone said to me in my youth. Um, but <laughs> but um, in in this this picture, as you said, was commissioned for the film adaptation of Oscar Wilde's story. And 
he was only hired to do the rotting portrait. Um, they had a different artist. Initially, it was going to be Malvin was going to paint the the traditional portrait, um, the good looking portrait. And then they went with somebody else and they hired Ivan to do all of the retouching going over that portrait to make it rot and to make like the make to make the decay because he's a good portrait artist, but he was really great at the the decay and that magical transformative, like you said, magical realism is what he's commonly associated with. Yes. Yeah, I'm taken away by the way that this portrait we're looking at, it feels like a zombie sort of a portrait. I mean, it's a a man standing in what at some point were probably nice clothes, but stained and torn. And I mean, he himself looks stained and torn and like the, the surroundings are all in shambles as well. We have like the, the carpet is ornately detailed. I mean, it looks like a floral sort of pattern rug that is now like folded over and crumpled and everything seems to be just in terrible condition. Except for the cat. Look at the little cat behind him. It it doesn't, that doesn't look like the cat got beat up, but you're right about the rug and everything else. Nobody can go after a cat. I mean, that's, (laughs) that's a line you do not cross. You do not mess with cats. Maybe. Um, Like, (laughs) It, it, it you can show a person as disfigured as you want, but you know you don't turn that on a, on an innocent animal. Right. I like your description of zombie because I never I never could pinpoint that until now that you're saying that, especially with the hands and. You're right. It's got that zombie quality. And maybe that's why I like it so much. Yeah. And, you know, when you look at it up close, I think one of the things he does so well is, as you talked about, the color, because there's this depth to the color that comes through because he's doing these glazes, these like transparent washes of colors that are like going over and over and over. And it's it's very time consuming and he does it he does it so well he has the patience of somebody who is not me because i i seldom have the patience to do that many layers of paint and on on scale no um <laughs> i'll do right. it for this a little is bit a huge but huge painting too yeah, it's 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 massive i mean it's it's you know life size really and that was the thing that always struck me about his work. It's not so much the imagery, because especially the older I get, the more I'm not super fond of dark imagery. Although in my teenage, like emo loving days, sure, I would have loved that. <laughs> but I, I really love just the application of paint. Yes. I mean, it's so well done. And I think what I really like about that is as I start to look, I see through to the layers of paint and it gives it gives all of the color this depth that you can't achieve in other ways. Like you, right. you just have to put in the time to do those washes of colors to get that that true depth and these details that you can discover on on closer inspection. Yeah, I agree. It had to take him forever to do this. The details are just absolutely incredible. I was trying to blow up and see the background behind him to see what else was in there. Um, But they just look like other bits of color and details and maybe things are torn behind him. I can't really tell. Um, I just love that the style, I haven't seen the style really anywhere else or anybody else painting this particular way. To me, in some way, it almost reminds me of um, Mata. Oh. You know, if you're familiar with Mata's work, it, like it has yeah, this, but... I mean, his his stuff was obviously more surreal and everything like that. But I, I, I was always struck by just the biomorphic shapes and the, the way that he often worked in layers. Like I'm thinking of his earth is a man piece that I, I kind of want to do a, a, a later episode on, but there's something about the way that he applies the color. Maybe it's the color scheme, but I feel like there's a good bit of layering in 
both of their works yeah. that I I am fond of. And Monica um, has a lot of that dreamy like quality, though it's a lot lighter, right? Yeah. Though the stuff in the background is you know, it's it's kind of standard stuff you would see in the background of a portrait just sort of transformed. There's the wallpaper peeling off of the walls, exposing some brick behind and, um, you know. Yeah. I was sort wondering, of, what's the left side, though? Because that's more on the right side. Am I, am I right? Uh, the left side. Now, what is all that? Is that still wallpaper? So I always just I always just assumed that was like a or is like it a drape like you know a curtain? I I always put it in that category. It looks like an upholstered like kind of a thing. Um, all those little, but I, yeah, I don't know. I don't know what the word for it. I'm going to cut all of this out because I feel like okay. this is a tangent where I'm just like exposing no, my own I... ignorance of how people live. <laughs> You know, it it's like me saying like I I, I just learned yesterday what a duvet is. <laughs> you know, um, oh. why would a bed have a skirt? <laughs> no, I totally get you. I know. I just was so fascinated by what is that? And there is a, a photograph I found in here where it looks a lot like the guy in the nice photo, although I don't know if that's exactly the reference. And it does look like some red fabric, but then there's like a slight frame behind it. Um, and then in other pictures, it looks like it's some ornate other type of frame that is on the wall, but it's hard to tell. Yeah, the frame almost feels like a mirrored frame, but then it's it's upholstered and it's probably like a piece of like a small piece of furniture that if you saw the whole room, it would it would give more context and make more sense. As I'm looking at it, it it feels like it just takes up it, it breaks up the negative space. Um, but then also the thing that I find most delightful about it is it makes it almost appear that there is a shrine to that cat. And oh, just yes, like, you're right. I, 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 I find something delightful about that just because it feels perfect for the internet age to have a shrine to a cat in a work. And I know that like, that's an anachronism and that was not <laughs> of the time, but, um, Ivan Albright was ahead of his time in so many ways. So Absolutely. I'm just, I'm just going to attribute that to him as well in much the way that people say Simpsons predicted the future. <laughs> I'm going to say Ivan Albright predicted the future. He he saw, you know, like My Chemical Romance and the the emo movement and he saw <laughs> like the the love of cats coming coming for the internet age before the internet was even a thing. Yeah, maybe cats of Instagram. <laughs> anything else you want to say about this one uh no i just love it i'm wrapping it up I want just a three point rating scale and where should this hang the loo is this something to look at the lab, the lab. is this something to learn from or the loo british for the bathroom yeah there's a the poop joke in there somewhere yeah. oh that's terrible all right what do you say because i'm not I, I can't decide actually. To me, this is a museum piece. I, I love it. I, I think there's a lot going on. I think as I look at it immediately, I see just a beautifully technically executed painting. Um, even if the subject is not so pleasant, but then when I get deeper into the subject, I mean, the, the picture of Dorian Gray is not really holding up Dorian Gray as a model for how people should conduct themselves. I mean, it's a cautionary tale about vanity and, and all of that sort of stuff. And I think this is another entry point. It, it hooks you in. It has some, some shock value, but there's something beautiful behind it. And there's just different layers of meaning and different things that people can pull from depending on what they are interested in and what they're looking for and what they appreciate in a work. I think it's strong conceptually. I think it's strong technically. I, I think, um, 
that's kind of what museums are all about. Yeah, I agree. So my my only tornness here was I would like to bring it home if I could. <laughs> <laughs> but otherwise, yeah, it does belong in a museum. Um, but part of me is like, wow, where could I, if only I had taller ceilings or bigger walls, if I could bring it home, that would be really great. Or if somebody was like, yes, you could borrow it for this month, I totally would. Or any of his pieces, that would be fantastic. But yeah, they do belong in museums. His work is so exceptionally wonderful. Yeah, and that's why the museums were snatching it up when the general public was not buying them. Right. And we are all better for it today because the museums have a giant collection of his work, especially our own hometown museum, the Art Institute. Yeah, we're quite lucky for that, for sure. Well, thank you so much for taking the time. I really appreciate it. Thank you. No, this is fun. It's just so fun learning the details. And I don't think I knew a lot about those sketches. And anytime, like I said, I'll put some of those up on the website so we can, you know, have a couple of those works, even though we're mainly focused on this one. Okay. This concludes this week's episode of Who Arted? If you found this tolerable, please like and subscribe on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you're listening. You can find images of the work being discussed this week and every week in the show notes on Twitter at WoodArtEd and on the website whoartedpodcast.com. Podcast done.